Libby? They have a really good wrestling team. <laughs> um, asbestos. WR Grace and the lawsuits over that. Like most mining, it started out with a bunch of people discovering there's some stuff here that we can dig up out of the ground and we'll get rich on. And like a lot of people, they did not think of the consequences, especially to human health. Was there a lot of mining in Lidney, Montana? It's pretty over there. <laughs> Landscaping. <laughs> they didn't know the entire like health risks that were involved and now as they are becoming more and more aware of these problems uh, it's a mad struggle to try to make someone accountable. It's a great insulator and it was mined there for a long time but now they're suffering from health consequences because it's a carcinogen and it just majorly screws up your lungs and all sorts of things and you still see it around today. I found some the other day um, on some old heating pipes. Montanans' attachment to preservation goes back a long and logical way. Indian culture and lifestyle, and air, forest, grassland, and water stewardship all grew from conservation principles. Visible abuses of the Montana environment, along with the vagaries of the market economy and mechanization, marked the state's boom and bust evolution. Although 20th century Montanans crave more industry and good jobs, we have rarely wanted those at any price. A look at the situation in Libby tells us a great deal about the balance we want to strike. the unquenchable, indestructible stone. Growing up here, I thought it was the best place in the world. It was out of the rat race, I guess. Anytime there was something to do or something had to be done, all the people in Libby would, would pitch in and, and do it to get the job done. Okay, that goes next to uh, her husband, wherever that is. Well, we haven't got that far yet. This is Libby, Montana, and things don't happen in Libby. If you couldn't read this in black and white, you couldn't believe it. It's a science fiction story. Well, Garrison, how come it's so short? Because he's got soft ground, and he's sunk. I have this perception that if you tell 12 people, those 12 people will go out and tell 12 more. For some reason, this story is so sad or so phenomenal that even, even jurors leaving a courtroom go out, and they are afraid to mention it because nobody is going to believe it. It should have been never allowed to have been able to happen. You spend your life trying to protect your family and you can protect them from something that you can see. The community and the people of Libby knew who they were, and they knew where they were going. People in this community have always worked hard. I mean, that's, that's their livelihood, and that's, that's their uh, heritage, and, and they've always done that. In those days, I mean, I guess we believed in, in everybody. A man's word was a man's word. Uh, deals were made on a handshake. I think the family was the number one priority. They would do anything to support their families. It was just a really a wonderful, small, very typical small town life. Of course, the first real settlers that stayed here were probably the loggers. Prior to that, the, the fur, fur traders, you know, would move on just as soon as they exhausted the, the fur in an area. It's just a, the classic example that happened throughout the West 
overcutting in the Great Lakes region and over harvesting there and the realization that the resource was was being depleted they knew there were no more frontiers in the lumbering industry so they wanted to make it work in Libby I think people in Libby developed this confidence that they would always have a job at the mill or in the woods and then their children if they wanted would be able to have the same opportunity Men went out every day and took the risk of being hurt or maimed or injured or killed. They employed up to 2,000 people in that industry. The mine was a little sideline that had maybe 150 people. It's a good place to grow up, I guess. I love the mountains. That's what I usually do is go hunting and fishing and stuff. That's about it. That's about all there is to do around here. I love Libby, but the people in Libby, I don't like them. Everybody's just so dang uptight. They've been living this way for 50 years, and their grandpa did it, and they put their boots under the same lamp every night, and if they're moved, oh boy. They don't like change, I guess I could say. Like, new people coming in, everybody will give them a hard time, you know? Like, they hate environmentalists and stuff, you know, but I mean, I mean, I see their point, yeah, because, you know, I've worked logging and stuff, too, but but they, they have a good point, too. I mean, you can't just go around cutting down the whole forest, you know, because, like, it's going to be gone. My family came to, to this area in 1945, and they fell in love with this, this area. So Dad ended up uh, going to work for the lumber mill for a while, and in 1954, he went to work for the Zone Light Company. And it's 80% of the world's vermiculite production for about 70 years. Uh -huh. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big deal. You know, right. upwards of 300,000 tons of, of ore concentrates leave right. the area uh, right. yearly. I'll now go ahead and swear in the witness, if you'll raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that this morning you're about to give in this manner be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth out of God? I do. Now, would you state your name for the record? My name is Earl D. Lovick. How long have you lived in Libby? Well, I've lived there now since 1948. What is vermiculite? It's a micaceous mineral, uh, which is... Uh, found near Libby, Montana, among other places. It opens up like the thing that causes it to, to expand or exfoliate is molecular water. And in pages in a book, which are made up of a lot of sheets, which is what vermiculite is, the water between those sheets forms to steam and it expands and it incre increases in size in only one direction rather than rather than overall. It's an insulation against fire. It can be used for insulation in homes. Uh, it can be used as a soil conditioner. Uh, they've even attempted to uh, make food out of it. They were <laughs> at one time they were experimenting. Uh, with uh, making cookies. In fact, they made some right here in, in, in Libby. W.R. Grace really marketed the product heavily and uh, production really took off. Boy, those were the jobs. Have a job at the mine you were someone in the community because you had steady employment. Uh, you could afford to give your kids things. You could afford to uh, 
have a nice house. Those are some of the really permanent and good jobs. My first experience there was, what in the hell did I get myself into? I just couldn't believe the, the dust and the, uh, I had this respirator on and in about 15 minutes I couldn't breathe. So I pulled this respirator off and it was just plug solid. I thought, boy, I'm not getting nothing done and if I don't, I'm gonna get canned. So I just pulled the respirator off and let it dangle around my neck here and I, and I really went to work. This stuff was in your clothes. It was everywhere. It was so fine. The only way you knew it is you'd pour out a cup of coffee and you look down and you could see it settling in the top of your coffee. But you couldn't see it in the air, but you could see it settling in your coffee. You couldn't get it off of me, really. It just stuck. Uh, same way with the ore, you know, and so I took it home with me. My oldest daughter and my oldest son, they'd grab me by the legs, you know, because they was happy to see me. And Christ, I was covered with this stuff, you know. It, it wasn't that I was being sloppy, it was just that I couldn't get it off. In my father's instance, he came home dirty and it was the dust. Dad would take the car to work in the daytime, he'd bring it home at five o'clock at night, and by six o'clock I would have the car and I'd be running up and down the main street. And the car was always full of dust. And you'd always make an apology to somebody when they get in the car, well, you know, it's just dust. Don't worry about it. Uh, is it correct from, that from 1948 on you knew and the company always knew that there was a serious health problem because of the large amount of dust concentrated there? It was certainly known that in some areas there were large concentrations of dust. And uh, it's certainly common knowledge that uh, too much dust of any kind uh, is, uh, is a, not a healthy situation. Grace was on the school board. Grace was on the hospital board. Grace on the bank. And when you talked about dust control here, at anything about the dust and and what it was doing harmful to these people here. The first thing that came out of their mouth was, you, you're gonna close that mine down and you're gonna put all these people out of work? But you didn't have very many friends when you started talking like that. The dust disease is what we sort of called it. And, and men would cough a lot and, 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 and get a lot of respiratory infections. And I started noticing that dad wasn't feeling good. I mean, there was something the matter. He just wasn't the same peppy self. And, and uh, he really didn't understand what it was. He finally went to the doctor, and the doctor gave him the news that he had a heart condition. In, in 1964, Dad was 52 years old to have a heart condition. His logic was, the company's watching out for me. Margaret, I can still work. They're willing to let me work with a heart condition and to bring home a paycheck and support you. And uh, he got so he couldn't walk all the way to the store without stopping and leaning against a fence post. But he was still working. So it was 1971 when, when he finally went to the doctor and, and, and the doctor said that he shouldn't work anymore. He didn't feel that he should. When this was submitted to Workman's Comp, they ordered him to go to Missoula to go to the doctor for an examination. And actually, I, my husband and I drove him down that day to Missoula to the doctor. and. He came out of the doctor's office and he was just stunned. And he said, the doctor said, there's nothing the matter with my heart. All the nitroglycerin they've given me over the years should have killed me. But he said, I have no lungs. In fact, when Narita and I got married, we lived right across the road from her folks. And I coughed, you know, a little bit when I was talking to her, which I do pretty often. She said, well, that's, that's the first thing. <laughs> So as of 1956, uh, the company knew there was asbestos in the dust, correct? Yes, sir. And the company also knew that uh, asbestosis is from inhaling asbestos dust, correct? Yes, sir. And the company also knew there were workers uh, at Zone Light who were inhaling asbestos dust, correct? Yes, sir. In 1956, did you did uh, the company disclose to the employees that the asbestos and the dust in the air was toxic? 
Not that I recall, no, sir. MSHAW, which is a, a government agency that inspects mines, well, they had a crew of four people come in, and the agent that uh, worked with me, his name was Robert Smith. And over the period of a couple of days, we, we got into conversations about different areas that he'd worked in, and he mentioned asbestos. And I said, well, we're fortunate here. We don't, we don't have asbestos. He said, you don't? No, I said, we have tremolite. And uh, he walked over to his, to his van and he got his, uh, mag he got a, a book of regulations out. It looked like about the size of the Bible. And he opened it up to uh, asbestos and tremolite was the first classifications of asbestos out of the category, and it was classed as one of the most dangerous because of the size of fibers. The administration officer was Earl Lovick. I was pretty upset. So I went back to his office, and uh, he was sitting at his desk. I said, Earl, we got a problem. I said, for a long, long time, you told us we had nothing to worry about this dust because it was tremolite. He said, that's right. I said, why in the hell didn't you go a step further and tell us what the hell tremolite was? It's one of the most dangerous forms of asbestos. And he put his hands out like and he said, Bob, I thought everybody knew that. And that really, that really upset me because we're not geologists, we're just working people. There's not a person on that hill up there knew, knew what the hell tremol, the definition for tremolite. And does that appear to be a memo from you to Mr. Kelly dated January 2, 1965? Yes, sir. The next page, do you see a listing of normal chests and abnormal chests? Yes, sir. Do you see Robert Cohenar, did he die of lung disease? Yes, sir. Jack Garrison, did he die of lung disease? Yes, sir. Ernie Hamilton, did he die of lung disease? Yes, sir, I believe so. Lewis Hoppy, did he die of lung disease? No, he drowned. And Michael McNair, did he die of mesothelioma? Yes, sir. And Lloyd Miller, did he die of lung disease? Yes, sir. Richard Rayom, did he die of lung disease? Yes, sir. That would be Lila Swelch. Yes, sir. Did he die of lung disease? Well, it was certainly a contributing factor. At this point in 1965, uh, was any information given to these employees that inhaling asbestos uh, dust could be dangerous and hazardous to their health? Specifically, I don't know that... Uh, we uh, gave any f specific uh, information on the hazardness of asbestos or whatever. My wife has it, my oldest daughter, and my oldest son. And just lately we found out that our youngest one, 32 years old, has got it. To your knowledge, did the company ever communicate to the workers in any way regarding precautions to uh, reduce the possibility of taking asbestos fibers home on their clothes? No, I don't know. I don't have to look very far in there to see people I know. could learn from what happened, don't let it happen again, and Libby to go on, and we, Libby will go on. The people, everybody uh, in the town itself will prosper, but it, it takes time, but that's true of anything.
thereby ask God's blessing upon the souls of the following persons. Steller, Hannah Palmer, Mike Palmer, Ren Palmer, John Parker, Clarence Peterson, Donald Peterson, E. Ross Peterson, Wayne Peterson, Red Post, Peter Powell, George Price, Virgil Priest, Richard Brown. It ain't a matter of luck. Just a matter of time Till the dust makes you choke And the dark makes you blind It ain't much of a choice When the noise and the silence Empty your mind 